something I said? <laughs> testing, testing. How's it? Okay. No, no fog horn that time. <laughs> Move it down a little bit more here. Is that oh, okay? I'm messing with it. What do you want me to do? Leave it? Up. Okay. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Okay. Okay. Pay no attention to the foghorn in the room. That's not me. <laughs> well, good morning, everyone. It's uh, good to be back after a couple of weeks. We had a great gathering at the hall last week. It was very enjoyable. Um, but it, it <clears throat> now that we're back, I'm going to be uh, taking a little bit different direction. Um, for those of you who were here, um, I might say a few things that you've heard before, uh, but for those who are listening online or just maybe for the first time, I want to bring us back up to speed on this subject that I have up here, what does it mean to believe on the name of Jesus? And in my opening class, um, I set out with, with a study to refresh ourselves on this topic um, because the Christian world through the centuries has made the true gospel into many confusing and distorted versions which we, we all know very well. And <clears throat> now there are many viewpoints of what it means to believe on the name of Jesus Christ. You could ask 10 people on the street, and you'd probably get a different answer from every one. Um, but what it's, we're going through to see exactly what the scriptures say. That's what we've been doing the last uh, uh, almost two months now. But my intent, as I had said, uh, originally was to do a deep dive into the gospels as we believe we have been given them. Um, to help stay, keep us focused on the gospel, we might think the gospel very first principles, and to some of us, you know, it's, 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 it's a no-brainer, but there's a lot of people who still, even amongst our own, who still struggles with maybe some of the finer details. And I picked that up uh, through the last year or two that, you know, maybe this is a subject that needs to be revisited, and of course, uh, this class was set in motion to cover all the, the different uh, doctrinal um, aspects of the gospel. Um, but really to help us stay focused with the simple but accurate truth that we share in the hope of Israel, which if you ask again, the same 10 people on the street, the hope of Israel may not even be part of it. They may not even mention that. But it's a very important part of it, as we know. This is our memory verse about how God is going to turn their hearts uh, back around. And I feel at this point we have covered uh, a lot of that really well. So I'm, um, uh, as I have been mentioning a couple of times over the weeks, that uh, we're going to uh, change directions here. There's so many buttons up here. Let's see. All right. So um, where I thought we'd go now um, is revealing the gospel through Scripture. Now, it might sound like the same, just another way of saying the same thing. Um, but I started, when I was working on this class, I was kind of wondering how to really make this a beautiful story, not just so much talking about our doctrinal beliefs and individual things, but the, the, uh, <clears throat> how the gospel grew and as, how it evolved uh, through the different men in the Bible. And I found it very intriguing, and I hope you'll enjoy it. Uh, as much as I did. So I'm going to take us now on a journey through Scripture of how the gospel was being revealed through the Old Testament, step by step, uh, and cross-reference with many of the fulfillments in the New Testament. That's what we're going to be doing here for the next couple of weeks. Uh, and this will show how it, it can't be said that the Old Testament is not important. You're going to hear that a lot when you ask people about the gospel. Whether we don't need the Old Testament anymore. That's kind of done over... Uh, the Jews messed up, but it's not important. Well, I hope to show very much over the next couple of weeks um, the value of our Old Testament and why it is still relevant. Uh, um, and the, the gospel was built and framed in the Old Testament, is my best way to put it. So let's go ahead and start this journey. I, I hope it's enjoyable. Some of it will be very basic at first, but I saw some very beautiful 
uh, shadows all through Scripture that sometimes we forget about. And when you line them all up as they unfolded through history, I found it very beautiful, and I, I enjoyed it very much. So I'm going to ask this question. Where would be the first mention of any hint of the gospel in Scripture? Think about that. Don't whisper. Genesis, very good. We're, okay, we're going to go, well, Genesis 1, but actually uh, we're going to go where we really hear about it the first time concerning the name of Jesus Christ is in the Garden of Eden. Uh, Matthew, Matt, since you chose to sit here, of your own free will, you're going to get called on here. Go ahead and just read this. Okay. Yeah. The Garden of Eden, Genesis 3, 13. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field, Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. All right, so where is the gospel? Uh, where, where do we see the gospel being started here? Where is the first hint of the things concerning the name of Jesus Christ? What's that? There, right, 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 those words right there. <clears throat> Where he put enmity, and for those who might be listening or not familiar with that word, it's kind of like an old English word, I guess. It means hatred or division. Um, but he would put hatred between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. This is, a, again, very basic to many of us. Uh, we've learned it as memory verses. Uh, but this, as best as I can tell, and somebody may have a, a better answer as we go along. I'm still learning myself. This is what I think is the first mention of the things concerning the name of Jesus Christ. Is there that his heel? Who is that? That's Christ. And here we have, right in the Garden of Eden, where this has um, been put in place. Um, this, this verse is critical understanding going forward through the whole Bible. It really, this is where everything that, that happens going forward has hinged on this verse right here. And if you don't feel, if someone doesn't feel the Old Testament is valid anymore, then you don't understand the importance of this verse. And you, can you imagine throwing this away and say, we don't need this anymore? That, that's the seriousness of this verse, of what it means, because it is the whole future of man's opportunity for salvation. Oh, okay, Randy? You might comment on who the seed of the serpent is. Right, well, we will. I'm going to be covering that. But you can answer the question, your own question there. <laughs> I think it was the Jewish leaders who opposed Christ because they were full of venom. Yeah, what were they, what were they referred to as? The sea, they were vipers. Root of vipers. Right. I think they're a very large part of it in, in Christ's day. But uh, I also feel like this is a sin that's in every, every man has come forward. Um, this is something that he, he, he um, affects every single one of us. And, uh, and we know that uh, very well from the scripture. We've got plenty of scriptures coming. So we'll sort all that out as we go along. But as you can see, we don't see anything about a kingdom here. But we do see some, the first thing concerning the name of Jesus Christ and what to believe on. And the Old Testament is very much a part of that plan. Um, so here's another, I guess, simple. Where, where do you think, or where does anyone think the second mention would be? Promises to Abraham. Not a little sooner than that. 
Anybody? Brady said Noah. No. Some of you might kick yourself. Oh, Cain and Abel? No. No. All right. Let me give you a little helper. Oh, Kathy. No. Um, hang on. I think I skipped too far. Hang on. Let me get back. All right. <clears throat> oh, uh, before we get to that question, I'm sorry, I got a real, little ahead of myself. Um, continuing uh, with what I was just saying, for here we see, what I wanted to do is make the connection to the New Testament here. Um, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also likewise took part of the same, that through death, he, Jesus, might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. And of course, this is where he, he, he crushed the head of the serpent. Um, and Coats us, of skin is the answer for the other that? part. Coats of skin. Okay. Sorry. Who's talk I can't hear who's talking. Oh, way back. Okay. All right. Yeah, you've answered the question right. We're gonna, I, I forgot to, to cover this slide before I went forward. I got it in my notes not to go there yet. So, yeah, that's okay. Um, but for us also, for I, Paul, know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing, for the will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. So obviously we have that flesh that needs to be crushed in us also. Christ has done it in himself, but he has a plan for that to be killed in us also. So... The second mention, uh, Robbie spoke up and said, that, okay, uh, uh, Brian, you want to read this? Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothed them. All right, it's a very basic verse. And if you didn't know the Bible well, you would think he's just covering their nakedness. But there's so much in that, isn't there? That we're going to look at the, that thread through Scripture here this morning. But uh, I've, I've uh, talked to several people who it never even registers with them that that has to do with the sacrifice of Christ. Um, there's one um, sister that I was privy to um, question. And uh, it wasn't until the questioning that that was really locked in. It did not understand that. So it was very important of what happened that day, that something died that day in their place. Um, well, where do we, this says nothing here about Christ, does it? Now, what, everything I'm saying, I'm implying that it, it sounds like it, but there's nothing here that would tell you Oh, that's Jesus, is it? Anybody think of a, a, a verse that uh, would tell us that this is Jesus? Um, I don't know. I, I don't know of a verse. I mean, I mean, I can certainly look it up, but uh, in general, what I see here when I see this verse is that the echoes to Christ are overwhelming because one that did not, one that was innocent, one that did not commit the sin paid the price and acted as a covering, which echoes what Christ would do because he would be the only sinless one. He was not um, for his sin worthy of death, just as whatever died to cover them, whatever animal was also innocent. They, they did not commit the sin. And this animal, you have to assume, if he named all the animals, there had not been death up to this point, he had a relationship with all of those animals, this animal would have been a friend. This animal would have been somebody that he had a relationship with that I'm sure would exceed any of the relationships we've ever had with you know pets that we have and <clears throat> so there is a there's a relationship there just as there was a relationship 
with Christ, you know, and those around him and his followers, and those since since then who are believers and baptized into his name. There was a relationship between the innocent that died here and Christ and what he would do in, in the future. So I, I, I mean, I can certainly look up a verse, but that's what to me is, is overwhelmingly here that we really don't seem to pause and consider. Yeah, thank you. Since I already have the mic up here, I, I noticed the part about the wife, obviously, um, unto Adam and also to his wife. And like, we're the bride of Christ, we're covered. Oh, very good. I hadn't thought about that before. Boy. I had a quick comment too. Did okay. someone else? Um, so I think there's two ways you can draw encouragement and, and a gospel echo from, these, from this verse. I think a lot of people will focus on the, the shedding of blood and the sacrifice that must have been necessary, which doesn't seem to be a big part of the focus of this verse, but you can read into it that that's likely what happened. But my, the thing that I like to focus on is that God provided the skins. God provided this covering, just like he provided his son Jesus to die for our sins. And, and whether, you know, you know, it was written how Jesus was going to be sacrificed and how his life was going to end. But when you take away all the, the legal ways that we kind of look at it, like the necessity of the shedding of blood and things like that, at the end of the day, God provided his son and God provided atonement for our sins, just like he provided a covering for their nakedness um, through the, the, the coats of skin that... that the Lord God made the coats of skin. All right. I'm going to John to follow else? up. Yeah. Hey. Hey. I just wanted to say something that just, I, I guess, kind of struck me now. That just as, because God does not see time as we see time, there's no beginning and end. It's not linear with him. He knows the beginning from the end because, you know, because we have a finite amount of time, we see time as a line. And he does not, just as he knew that his son would need to die, he also knew that this animal or animal is a, would have to die when he created them. He, they would be the first step. Um, so that's something that just just kind of struck me now. Very good. I'm glad. If, see, that's, that's one reason this class will stir you to think about things. But I do have a verse. In my opinion, that directly, direct, directly connects Jesus to this verse. And that's it. What's that? Okay. That's what I was going to bring up. Oh, okay. Um, depending upon your translation, either the, the names of the righteous, their names were written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, or some translations have it as the lamb was slain from the foundation of the world. Um, and I think where you're going is the latter, that uh, this could harken back to the Genesis 3 um, statement. Um, that, that's, a, that's a valid um, interpretation. But the Jewish people had a habit of um, assigning pre-existence to things that are or were essential in God's plan from the foundation of the world. Uh, they talk about the Torah, even Moses himself pre-existing from the foundation of the world, simply because there's a, there was a series of things in God's plan that were in his thought, in, in his mind, so to speak, from the foundation of the world. One is, of course, the Messiah and uh, the need for him to, um, to, to shed um, his blood. And, you know, there's a saying, God prepares the cure before the wound. Um, and here we would see that uh, this would make sense that in God's mind, he already knew that there was a need for uh, you know, a savior, a Messiah, or a lamb mm -hmm. um, before Adam even sinned. You yeah. know? So that, that could also be another way to interpret this passage. But yeah. I think we're, we're on the same wavelength. Yeah, this, this is, was always very uh, powerful to me to connect. And no, notice, if you would, we hear it in Genesis and then in Revelation. In the beginning of the end of Scripture, that there's this 
in there that from the first book to the last book, Christ is there as that lamb, uh, slain from the foundation of the world. Joanne, got your hand up? Genesis 24, it gives us the way to the tree of life, which is the way to the kingdom. What's that? I'm sorry. Right here, the way to the tree of life would be to the kingdom. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you. What was, I'm sorry. Was, are you asking me a question? I, I couldn't no. hear it really well. No, I think she's making the point that the echo of the kingdom is, is there in verse 24 oh, of that oh, chapter. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Very good. Yes. The way to the tree of life. Okay. Right. Okay. Thank you, Joanne. Yeah, thank you. I'm glad these little things come out because I don't have everything. But I will ask a question before we move on. What's that? Oh, David. I'll just, just I, I was just going to make the point that uh, you can see Abraham gets all of this as well because yeah, we're going to cover that. The um, Adam and Eve tried to cover themselves, and they can't do it. And you know, man cannot save himself or cover himself. God had to provide that covering, and so when Abraham took Isaac up to offer him, you know, Abraham, uh, Isaac said, "Well, where's the?" Where's the animal? And God and Abraham said, God will provide the lamb. And so this covering that he provided is Abraham realized that God was the one that's going to provide that covering. Yeah, thank you. I was just going to ask the question, why were the fig leaves inadequate? A lot of people may don't think about that, especially I'm trying to also keep a sharp when people we talk to people and they might this this verse in Genesis, if you really had no real knowledge of the Bible and you're just trying to learn, it might look like, hey, you're naked. I'm going to put some clothes on uh, and move on. Why were the fig leaves not acceptable? Because they made them. That's right, very good. They made them. They could not clothe themselves, and obviously it's not something that's going to really do the job in the long run anyway. So that's very important that we cannot find our own salvation. We have to take the course that has been laid out in Scripture. And Jesus was that lamb that was symbolically slain in those coats of skin when they put them on. And they were in type putting on Christ. And we're going to look at that here in a second. And to me, is one of the most beautiful shadows, I, I think, in Scripture. Um, but anyway, I was, it's all, you're going to find as we go through this, there's going to be several times where we're in Genesis and then we jump to Revelation. Uh, uh, more proof of it, and that has always been so critical to me. But let's look at this this string through the Bible here. We have a couple of verses here. Galatians three twenty seven, for as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And we've got to go back to that Garden of Eden when they put those those skins on. They were putting on that covering. We put on Christ. Also. Um, 1 Corinthians 15, 53, for this perishable body must put on the, the imperishable, and this mortal must put on immortality. This phrase, put on, is, is really a theme that is so beautiful about the putting on. Um, it's like a golden thread through the gospel. I like to call it something like a golden thread that you can follow all the way from the Garden of Eden to the book of Revelation. And uh, this really shows how we need the whole Bible. We can't nullify any part of it because then you will break that string. Um, all right, who's next? Uh, Mike, you want to read this one for me? Uh, Ephesians 4, verse 21. Uh, if, so be, if, if so be that ye have heard him, and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that ye put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Think about 
when they were wearing those fig leaves, did they keep them on as, or did they take them off? They were taken off, and they because it was not acceptable. But we put on the new man. And that's the beauty of the scriptures uh, with the Old Testament. It's just a wonderful, beautiful story of what has been provided for us. But uh, as we, uh, I think it was Robbie said, we could not provide for ourselves a way to salvation. You can't be an island unto yourself. I don't need anybody. I can do this all by myself. I live a good life. No, you, it has to be a taking off of something and a putting on of something new. And the Garden of Eden was that, that moment that that first happened is so critical to our understanding of all of this through the Scripture. This, is, again, is a, a looking back to the Old Testament, but looking back to the Garden of Eden uh, very much. Um, so Ephesians has taking off and putting on. Um, okay, now let's move on. Uh, that's, uh, there's enough there from the Garden of Eden. I don't want to labor it too much, but uh, let's move on to someone else uh, that, like David brought up here. Is it Kathy, did you read yet? Genesis 3.14 And the Lord said unto Abram, After that lot was separated for him, Lift up now thine eyes and look from the place where thou art northward and southward and eastward and westward. For all the land which you see, to thee will I give it and to thy seed forever. Okay, this is another verse that we know all, all too well. But unless somebody can show me otherwise, and I'm more than happy to be shown otherwise, uh, this, I think, as best as I could find, is the first mention of a land area of the kingdom with the seed. So see, we have the, the gospel being revealed through time, through the, there's Adam and Eve, and now we've come to Abraham, and we get another little bit of the gospel uh, growing here. Um, but as best as I could find, this is the first place where we see those two things. Um, here is where we could say for, there's the first mention of the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ in a very mustard seed form. It, again, it's a beautiful story. It, it's not just the gospel, or it's not just the New Testament. It's this beautiful story that's been unfolding through history. And as long as I've been in the, the truth for, for over 40 years, I enjoyed this, this last couple of months very much going through and, and trying to line all this up and, and watching that journey. And I never saw it in um, the beauty of it uh, until this. Uh, Robbie? So this is a question I have, and it, it's a little bit off subject, but I think it still fits. And this is a, a question I don't know the answer to. Is is does anyone know if is there a spirit a link to the spiritual seed of Abraham found in the Old Testament? So does the spiritual seed of Abraham only come about in the New Testament, or is there evidence of a spiritual seed of Abraham in the Old Testament? Okay, so say Stacy says types through the Old Testament. Randy, well, he says your seed shall be as the sand of the seashore and as the stars of heaven. The stars of heaven are thought to be the spiritual seed. Okay. Sorry, I didn't mean to hijack your class. It just kind of brought that question up for me. Well, I also think where in thee shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, if that's anyone who comes in. Um, that's true. That's the, if I got your question. Right. That's a good point. Thank you for fielding that. No, this is good. It shows uh, what different people, different, all of us are really in a little bit different place than the guy sitting next to us. And what we've learned, what our journey has been, the people we've come in contact, whether we were raised in the truth or not in the truth, but to some of us, we might be 60, 70 years old, but we've only been in the truth for 10 years, you know, where I've, I've been around it uh, for 65 years. So it's, so I can't expect anyone to be where I am, and, or, you, you know, and vice versa. Uh, so it's the beauty of it when we all come together, 
and share where we are and what we're learning. All right. Um, let's see. In Galatians, here, here's Genesis to Galatians. Um, Casey, I guess you're next. Galatians 3.16, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to seeds, as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. Okay, the reason I have this verse is for the one in Genesis. Um, it's very easy to think of that as a plural seed. And in some cases, there is a plural seed talk about the nation of Israel. But Galatians here makes that binding tie, so to speak. Uh, to exactly, uh, I think, what God was telling them, the, the, the most important part of it, that it would be that way. And here we have to go to Galatians to get that lip, the way it's said and how it's, and with Christ already come and gone to heaven, you can connect those dots uh, where they would not have been able to connect those dots before. But this is a lot of dot connecting that's taking place through history. And this is our confirmation of Genesis, of exactly what it means. Again, the beauty of the Old Testament with the New. All right. Um, let's see. Randy, I guess you're next. You read this. Galatians 3, 8 and 9. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, in thee shall all nations be blessed. So then, they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. There you go. There's, here's, it's a very well-known verse amongst us that the gospel was preached to Abraham. And if people think that the gospel started at Matthew and went forward from there, look what you've missed. Abraham is not even a part of it in your mind. And I, I told... I. I might have said the story in an exhortation as I, I can't remember it for, but there was a, a, a friend that uh, Kathy and I were teaching uh, years ago uh, when we were, uh, our kids were all little, little kids, babies. And she, wanted, we, she got interested to a point, and when we tried to tell them about Abraham, she had no idea, and she believed that she believed the gospel. She was convinced she believed the gospel. She had no idea who Abraham was. And when we showed these verses, she was frustrated by it. And I'm just giving you an example of how people sometimes respond to this and said, you know, I've, I've learned to love Jesus. Now I have to learn to love this guy, Abraham. And she really didn't go past that point. It was like, it was formed. And these are people who supposedly have been going to church all their life, and they've never could tell you who Abraham was or that he was even important to your life and to your inheritance. So that's why I like to go over these again because we're all running into people who will have their own stories like that. And um, it's very important that we recognize the value of this and teach this as, as, as very strict understandings of what God has laid out in the scripture. Um, as we can see that he was promised the land, uh, uh, we know that he was promised the land. He was never anywhere promised that he'd go to heaven. He was never told, you're going to one day come up here and be with me, and things like that. He was everything that Abraham inherits is on the earth. And if, what, if we inherit what Abraham inherited, then we inherit the earth. These are just reasonings that need to, it's good to have in our head uh, of these things. And if Abraham's not going to heaven, I'm not going to heaven, because he'll get there a lot quicker than I will. So if, if there was ever that even possibility. So anyway, just stuff like that is the, what I've gone through my years of the conversations I've had of the importance of this. Yeah, I think we've got time for one more. Ver uh, now, here we jump to Hebrews and the New Testament. Oh, sorry, uh, just sort of a sidebar oh. question, just a, an odd thought maybe. That is, you know, we're jumping from Abraham, or I'm sorry, from Adam to Abraham. And um, while it doesn't look like it, based on the number of chapters, that's 2,000 years of history. Oh, very good. And okay. so all those people, do we have any hint whatsoever or any 
thoughts whatsoever of what those people for 2,000 years may have known, what they may have been able to um, grasp onto. Mm -hmm. I have no idea. Well, do you have the reference to like the sons of God and the sons of men, right? So that could give you an indication that there was a separate group of, of people that were quote unquote considered the sons of God, mm -hmm. you know, following after the ways of God. But that then, like but, yeah, I know exactly. Yeah. We also know because of the, the um, offerings that Cain and Abel brought, there was some type of religious order. So that they hadn't been given. We don't know the details of it other than that they brought their offerings and God rejected one and accepted the other. So there was obviously some understanding in there that uh, maybe it hit the, maybe it died with the flood. I don't know. So I'd, I've always felt like there was some understanding. They just weren't totally ignorant up to Noah's day. Still uh, says. So my last exhortation, um, I had pointed out, it was about um, the tale of two cities, and it was focusing on what happened after the Tower of Babel and, and how, you know, there's possibility even Abram may have been an idolater. But if you looked at the, the time span, or the, the, you talked about 2,000 years, Casey, but it sounds like a lot of years, but if you're, your lifespan in some cases, like 800 years, 900 <laughs> years, there's only two or three generations. <laughs> so, and, and it, it does puzzle you, though, how could someone like Abraham, who actually was, uh, I can't remember exactly, I had a chart that showed you like an overlap. I can't remember if it was Shem or one of the sons of Noah. It may have very well been alive in the time of, of Abraham. So it's like the knowledge would have been out there but why, how could it have been lost so quickly? Where you have even Abram, you know, in this area of Mesopotamia, it, it's like they're already worshiping the moon god and, and the various other, you know, stars. And, and it is so amazing how quickly man can just mess things up um, within two or three generations. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's very sad. Um, but the other thing I was going to mention was that with Abram, this morning, I don't know if anyone's done the readings. Abram's told that he was going to sleep with his fathers. And I had asked Lisa, correct me if I'm not wrong, if I'm not wrong but is the only other place that death, where God has actually mentioned death, is here and in the Garden of Eden when he talks about the, the curse, you know, unto dust thou shalt return. Those are only two instances where God's actually said something with respect to death. You know, you do have the genealogies, you know, Seth lived so and so, died, had children, and so forth. But this reference to Abraham sleeping with his fathers, he was being told something about death, and also it was tied to the promises that. Um, the promises were, were, going to succeed, were, were going to be a long term fulfillment, and somehow it was going to involve death, that he was going to overcome death. Um, so, anyway, I just I thought we'd throw all that together. That's a good thought. And thank you, Bill. Okay, it looks like we're out of time, but we'll pick up with Abraham uh, next week. Thank you.